All right, awesome. Thank you everybody for coming to our webinar. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking a lot about AI tools integrated into D5. Again, my name is Andy Cristoforo. I'm the Senior Applied Technology Specialist at KPF. And just a little bit of background, I'm a licensed architect. I've been in the archivist space for about yeah, 15 years now. Uh, and a lot of what I do is kind of look at the landscape uh, of tools out there and try and understand what we can integrate and leverage um, at our firm. Because we, we see there's all these fantastic tools out there. And if we're not on the forefront, we're going to fall behind, lose jobs. And it's important for us to just understand what's out there. So just to talk about our learning objectives real quick, we're going to talk about some typical struggles probably all of you face. Uh, we'll talk about how D5 has kind of revolutionized our own workflow and how AI tools are directly baked into it and has really made our life pretty easy. Um, so I'm excited to share our story of um, or our journey with D5. So just an overview of what we'll be talking about. I'll give you some context, set the stage for this presentation. I'll talk about all the AI goodies in D5. We'll even cover a KPF case study. And this is actually what brought us to this point and why we decided to move forward with D5. So we'll share the results, some images from that. Then I'll be doing a completely live demo of how you actually import a project, materialize it, light it, render it, and get it ready for a client, all in 25 minutes. So it's going to be crazy, it's going to be wild, but we'll do it. And then I want to talk a little bit about how to drive adoption within your own firm. And this is for just AI and even D5, and just like how to get those tools in front of the right people. Okay, all right, so in terms of where we are, typical industry struggles uh, that we all kind of face in our firms is when it comes to new software, there's always a very high learning curve and people are scared to, you know, devote time to learning a new tool because everyone's got crazy deadlines, right? The deadlines are shrinking, we're forced to produce more, and everything is just as demanding um, as it's ever been. So the other issue is because of all, all this stuff being thrown at us and how fast we have to turn around things, there's a huge difficulty in creating high quality assets, whether that's 3D models or renderings, or just deliverables for clients. We're also struck with this issue of collaboration tools. Our main tool set don't really offer collaboration in an easy way. Like we don't really have the beauty of like Figma and Miro within you know, our 3D tools, our design tools. And they're kind of there, but they're like so clunky and difficult to work with. And then we have you know, costly outsourcing. We feel like our, our vendors are charging a lot more for imagery. We need to kind of focus a little bit more on doing in-house images. And then lastly, just how do you manage standards across a global firm? You know, KPF is 600 people. We have over a dozen offices. How do we actually have a uniform standard across all those offices? So about a year ago, uh, leadership took this kind of seriously and we, we kind of thought about what are the needs of the studio? I was stepping into a new role where I'd be managing all the visualization efforts at KPF in addition to the AI efforts. So we wanted to tackle what the biggest issues were. So the biggest thing was we need to improve our viz quality. So by default, we just want better results. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of time making nice images. You know, obviously, that'd be nice, but nobody's paying us to do that. Everything is, is kind of rushed, right? So we want out of the box, better results. We want more functionality. Um, you know, We adopted AI just once it was out there, we were on top of it. So we wanted our tools to actually have AI tools in there because it makes our lives better. You know, it speeds things up. We can reduce TDM. That's really what we are looking forward to uh, with the promise of AI, of course. Then we want more tool compatibility. Our projects are getting more complex. We're dealing with a lot more consultants. We're dealing with files from 3ds Max, Rhino, Revit, CAD, you name it. And we need to be able to aggregate it into one spot. Then we've got kind of this issue we've seen with you know, the larger companies, I'm not going to name anyone, where we have all these feature requests and it just feels like we give all this great feedback and just nothing's done. We want to be able to talk to a company and have that feedback just directly implemented into the software. So if we have a bug or we just want a new tool, it's there and we know we're supported by the devs. And what was very important to leadership is just firm standards. There's no reason why Team A's renderings are so much better than Team B or why team A is rendering the same glass material a um, hundred different times. There's no need for them to be making those materials from scratch every time. So how can we standardize all that? So again, like I was saying, we 
we're all AI forward and we really believe it's going to help fix some of the issues we have um, with these like tightening project deadlines and having to create more, more deliverables. So we think AI is a way for us to do more in less time. And by adopting AI, we feel like we're so much more competitive because we're able to generate more in less time. So it's really important for all of our tools to integrate AI to some degree. So I want to show a little teaser about how this actually works and what I'm actually talking about with how AI can be integrated into the design process. So here is a little teaser um, of D5 High. So this is their AI generative tool where you can actually generate prompts, expand your prompts, and have it create nice images based off of a structure image. So you see an image is dropped in, and then you can design different variations, all from sentences. So imagine having to model that and then change the materials for all those options. And then there's the nice little features like generating texture maps. So we upload a sample material. It can make it high quality. It can add texture maps, like normal maps, to make it look realistic. Because in general, a regular architect doesn't want to deal with that. They just want beautiful materials fast. So leveraging that's been huge. Having asset libraries, very, very important. And I'm going to go into detail with all these um, after this, but just want to give you like a teaser of what we'll be talking about. One of my favorite features is AI atmosphere match. We're all designers, so we think in like pretty pictures. So the ability to like upload an image and then have it change all your settings to match that image, that's huge because nobody wants to tinker with you know settings all day long. They just want the pretty image. So being able to cut down on that time has been huge. Uh, we're also shifting to do more animations. So to make animations a little bit easier, there's these fantastic templates built directly into D5. So now anyone can generate um, videos and animation very quickly. So we'll be talking more about this. Um, let me go next. And of course, stuck. Nice. Great. All right. So let's talk about how this works into workflows. So traditionally, um, we basically start with sketches, then we move to 3D modeling, and this is the traditional method, right? And then we have to leverage a lot of our external libraries. And as you guys know, it's so difficult to manage all those 3D assets of like trees, furniture, people, entourage, and you're bouncing between all these different softwares that don't speak well to each other. And it just feels like a nightmare having all your materials and 3D models in one spot. And then once you've got it into your 3D rendering software, then you need to visualize it. And that can take a lot of time when it comes to light setup. Like I was saying earlier, nobody likes tweaking the light settings and making it look nice. You know, maybe some of us do in like the design technology world, but the typical architect just needs like a sunset rendering and be ready to go. And then there's post-production. Uh, you know, a lot of us just go to Photoshop. We spend a lot of time there trying to beautify things. And it just, it's really, really time consuming. So what we've been proposing with the, uh, the D5 like AI workflow is we're able to do kind of like our early sketches or design iterations with D5 High, literally change, you know, a color name and it will give us new options. So instead of red brick, we could see it in black brick without even having to touch uh, the 3D render, which is really nice. And then all the texture work can live within D5. We can actually have a cloud library where all of our assets are there. It can enhance the quality of it. We can also leverage the fantastic library in there. So it's got people and cars and trees. So we don't need to find that. That's been a huge pain. And then with the AI atmosphere match, we can easily grab images from Pinterest or generate them in mid-journey and then just have it make it look like that. You know, it's, it's amazing. And then we'll talk a little bit about this, which is post AI, which is an upscaler. So it just beautifies the overall image. So we don't even need to go to Photoshop. We can do all of our color correction and all the details will um, look much nicer. So I'm going to be going through all these, but again, just a little teaser. And this is kind of how D5 High works. It's, we can start with a sketch, feed it a reference image, and it can turn that sketch into like an actual image. So that's really huge for us because now instead of modeling that and then rendering that, we could just do all of our concept work with two images. The first image being a sketch and the second image being a style reference. So this is huge. Like the idea to generate all these iterations in a very short period of time, that's really fascinating, especially like from a designer's point of view where the client has all these different ideas and you know, obviously you need to vet them to make them happy. But the manual process of doing this is, is really, really time consuming. So I was touching on this earlier, but when it comes to texture work, designers aren't, you know, really like trained in the way of like creating high-risk textures. They usually find an image, 
from a vendor's website, they drop it in and they call it a day. Having these AI tools where you can actually upscale directly in the engine so they don't have to go elsewhere, that's huge. Like that's, that's a no brainer for us. So here's a comparison. This is usually what renderings you know, used to look like. And now with the upscaler, we're getting really nice sharp details. And it only takes like a couple seconds. That's the beauty. Like we don't have to go to Photoshop and spend time clone stamp and upscale. It's, it's all done directly in D5. Seamless textures. This is something that we all struggle with. You know, I used the example before of people grabbing sample images. They're always tiling. They look horrible. They're not great. Um, this, it fixes all the seams. It helps blend it. It makes it look a lot more realistic. So just these like little things are kind of a big deal when you talk about a company that's like 600 people. If you've got hundreds of people making images every day and you can save them, you know, an hour in their day times, you know, a couple hundred people. That's, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. You know, this is what I mean by how AI is just like a no-brainer, and it should be in all of our tools. So with the AI texture maps, you know, again, you can upload a really simple image. It's kind of flat. Then you run it through the process, and now it'll add all those details. It'll take care of your normal maps, which is you know the height differences between you know cracks and crevices and raised um, pieces of uh, of geometry. It'll do that. It'll add reflections and everything. You know, huge difference in just again a couple of seconds because nobody wants to make normal maps anymore. Okay, it's that's the reality of it. So to have our tools do a lot of the boring work for us, that's huge. That's something we invest in. And what that used to look like, especially on the tile side, is you know you would have it. You have to go into Photoshop and then you'd have to manually create all these maps. You know, you'd have to run it through. The normal map generator, or then you'd have to make everything black and white for roughness map, and it's just like a really time-consuming, you know, high skill set type of uh, workflow that a typical designer has no interest in doing. If they can click the, you know, make a pretty button, that's that's what we want to do. That's where we want to follow. So then I touched on this earlier, the AI atmosphere match. Again, we're talking about grabbing one image and it changing all your your time of day settings your color correction settings. And in the demo, I'll, I'll show like how powerful that is. Because a lot of our, our design leads, you know, they don't really understand all the, the technical parts, but they do understand a beautiful image. So if they can give a beautiful image to a junior and say like, make it look like this, and they can literally drag it in and it'll match the settings, why not, right? So here's an example of one of our case study projects, but these are all different images just blended together. We uploaded you know, a sunset image and then it gave us that pink looking one. We uploaded like a dark and gloomy one and it gave us that, that dark image. So all it takes is literally one reference image as you can see here, and it will apply it to the actual scene. That's this guy. And then post AI is going to bring out all those details. It'll make vegetation look better, materials sharper. Um, and overall, it's just a nice little polish pass uh, over your images. Uh, the next is a uh, style transfer. This is brand new. Um, we can literally change from a realistic image to a stylized image. And one of the reasons we do this is if you start rendering photorealism very, very early on in the project, you kind of give the client false expectations as to like what the materials are. You don't want to confuse them because you might not even have materials yet. So we've been leveraging style transfer a lot just because it's a little softer on the eyes. It's it's more uh, gestural. It's it's not like, hey, we're going to have this like concrete or this brick here. It's more like this is kind of what we're thinking color palette wise. So it kind of takes the weight off the designers to make everything super photorealistic and figure out everything early on. I want to talk about some nice time savers um, that we found. We have live sync plugins. So literally, you know, you've got Rhino or 3ds Max on the left. And it's pushing all your changes in real time on the right. There's no lag between them. Works with all these softwares. And it's just nice because you have your design companion, you know, like there's some other examples. In Revit, instead of looking at the ugly Revit viewport, you can look at a beautiful rendered viewport. You can bring all your, your, your saved views, all your lights, all that comes over. You're not losing any geometry. And like the D5 viewport is much nicer to look at than, than Revit. So it's kind of nice that you can just design and render at the same time. The same thing for Rhino. Literally, when you model something, it will update instantly. Uh, so this side-by-side -side view, very, very popular. I'm sure many of you do this, but it's it's really nice and convenient. So as of this week in 2.9, we got Terrain. 
which is great because a lot of the, the KPF projects are very, very large. They take up a lot of areas. And sometimes there's always beautiful, you know, vistas in the background. So to be able to just like upload a black and white height map and then model it further is, is really nice. Give it some convincing um, details. Instead of relying on like a 2D backdrop or a plane, you could just have really nice context. Uh, and then we have weather. I mean, we, you know, typically we render with like sunny day, you know, semi overcast, but being able to see it in different settings and not worry about, you know, modeling snow and deformation and making sure our materials support snow and everything. Like it's, it's so much nicer that you can just like toggle between, you know, this is going to be rain, this is going to be snow, and you can set up those different views very easily. Uh, this is huge for us because, because of how large our projects are. There's this uh, tool called Scatter, which it will literally spawn hundreds of assets over a certain plane. So instead of you manually placing them or brushing them, you just give it the assets that you want, some parameters, and it will spawn. So during the demo, I'll show you how that works. Uh, this thing is incredible. Um, parallax is huge for us. So what this is doing is usually because of the type of work we do, we don't really have the interiors modeled very early. So when you do a rendering, you just see like slabs and you just see through. It doesn't look great. So what the parallaxes do is very cheaply, you've got a 2D plane that's mimicking depth. So depth meaning like foreground and background. And as you rotate, you actually see more in that plane. So it's a plane that's mimicking a whole room. So it's a really clever way to get more detail. So we've been using this a lot, especially for our towers. And I'll show you in the demo like why it's so important. So render ready materials, the asset library, can't stress how important it is. In general, designers, you know, they're, they're learning like what makes a beautiful material, but it's so much easier if we can have something ready to go. Even if it's like our own library that we have saved in, um, in D5, just for them to use that, huge time saver. You can see variety of assets, uh, really, really useful, especially for the type of work we do. And then this is brand new, phasing animations. I think this is incredible. I mean, we are moving more and more towards animation. So to kind of make it a little bit more immersive and engaging, to just have it like pull apart the building, I think uh, it's going to be great. This was just released like this week. So we're excited to get our hands on it and, uh, and see what our clients think. So I talked earlier about settings and like firm standards. There is a cloud space if you're using the team plan. So we can literally upload time of day settings, like light settings, materials, and entourage. And anyone who's got like no experience with DeFi can just like click, oh, this is the KPF, you know, sunset. This is the KPF overcap. Oh, this is the standard glass material we use. And they don't need to worry about all the back end, like how to do that. That's huge. That's great for like juniors or interns, like people coming new to the firm who don't really understand what's like the the correct way to do things. So this is huge. Um, yeah, we've been using it nonstop. And I'll show you in the demo what ours looks like. So we we're talking about the animations. Again, we're trying to do more of it because it's very expensive to do it outsourced. I mean, we're talking about like one minute could be 15 to 30 grand. That's a lot of money that we could potentially be saving by doing this in-house. Um, so I'll be showing a little bit about this in the demo, but we can use animation templates to do all the typical arc viz moves. So it's like your, your push, your pan, your dolly, your orbit, all that can be done uh, with templates. So I'll show you what that's about. Uh, but here are some examples of like what you can do, you know, slow, simple zooms. We're not doing anything crazy. It's just zooms, change of time of day. You can key different things. So here you can literally do a sun study uh, if you want. Uh, so really powerful that the animator actually supports all this. Uh, and it's not just camera view, they can actually be a lot more dynamic. Like here we've got moving doors and everything and moving fans, rotating. Um, so again, a lot of, a lot of power here. Okay, cool. So I want to talk a little bit about the case study. And I just want to make sure I didn't miss the slide. Nope. Yeah, okay, cool. So this is the case study that kind of like showed us that, wow, okay, D5 actually makes a lot of sense for us. So this is a project called the Soho Gube. Um, and basically what we did was we wanted to try and render it as realistically as possible and understand the time and effort it took. So these are actually renderings from D5. And like, they look phenomenal. This didn't take much time for us to do in-house. Um, and we literally had like no training. So we were able to mimic all the vegetation, 
the materials of the project, the overall look and feel of the lake, like, and this is what our uh, demo project will be. Like, I'll show you how to build this. Um, but it was like, just a complete no brainer. Um, and we could easily add context, beautiful sky settings, and it just supported everything we needed. And we're like, okay, D5 is like checking off all the boxes we had. Like we're talking about high realism in less time. It's got all those great AI tools, the presets, the cloud space. It's just like all the issues we had a year ago when I had my initial conversation with leadership are now being answered by like one tool. And the devs listen to us, right? Like when we're talking about adding, you know, a feature and then we get it in like two weeks or a month. Like it's, it, it's amazing. So having this like, Partnership between us has been really, really useful for us. Um, and the images are great. Like aerials are something that we would never do um, in house just because of like how much like square footage there is to cover. But to be able to like kind of do it ourselves is actually really nice because we never like get to view the building in house like this. We always have to wait for an external render, and that could take weeks to get a view like this. So for us to kind of you know, put together all these components, like the lights, the fog, the scattered vegetation, vehicle path, and do it ourselves and see what it would look like and then have it rendered in less than a minute. Like that's, that's huge for us. Now we're, we're able to leverage tools a lot more in-house and not worry about outsourcing everything. So just like a little breakdown, and this is what we'll be building, but it's, these scenes are just really a combination of, you know, Rhino files, Revit files, FBXs, scatters, asset libraries, and then there's also this concept of work setting. So if you have multiple people in a project, they can actually work together. It's kind of like a Revit's uh, sync to central concept. So you can have one person working on the landscape and one person working on the building, and they're literally working together, which is awesome. And you can leave comments for each other and you can see the other person's progress. So it's great for us because we're always dealing with these super large projects. We don't do one family houses, like we do the biggest skyscrapers in the world. So to be able to do this together, huge. And each of these scenes can also have different times of days. So like this one was our day scene, this one was our night scene, and it just switches between them and it saves all those settings. Like, okay, these are the night settings, these are the layer visibility toggles, all that's saved. And here's some comparisons of interior renderings we did. And like, you can see, looks really good. The only difference is like some trash here in the real photo that we didn't model, but like, you know, the materials here and the slats and the glass, it just everything was there that we needed. And here's another example. So photo on the left, D5 render on the right. You can see the, the global illumination looks great. We're actually seeing like the proper light scalloping here. The materials look spot on. Everything looks great. Like it even mimicked the light right up here. You see that, that gradation? So really crazy that we're able to do this ourselves, like as designers and not, you know, specialists. So at the end of the case study, this is kind of what we found out just by doing, you know, a pilot project with a team. Um, we were getting 4K images in about 40 seconds. The quality of our floor increased. So right out of the gate, we were getting nicer results. And the team that did our pilot project, we saved about 25 grand in outsourced renderings because instead of them buying, you know, five to 10 renderings, they were able to just do it all themselves in an afternoon. I mean, it's like, that was a no brainer. So um, yeah, we were really happy with how this turned out and we're, we're kind of seeing more and more teams leverage this and they're realizing, oh wait, I don't need to outsource everything. We can actually do this ourselves. So I'm going to tackle our, our little demo right now. Let me make this. So I know I was talking about how awesome D5 is and everything, but I want to show you like, this isn't like all smoke and mirrors. So. I have the D5 launcher here. You're seeing me launch it from scratch. There's no off the camera kind of stuff. I'm literally showing you like what it takes to build a project and how simple it can be. So what I always do when I start a project, we need to get the geometry in. So I'm just going to hide my little zoom guy here. So I go over here, I'm gonna import my files. I'm gonna import these guys and they're going to load in. So once the percentage is gone, that means it's already been saved to D5. So I'm just waiting for these guys to finish up. This one I know is super chunky. So I'm gonna give that a second. Um, but once these files are in, I'm going to drag them out and then I'm going to sync them all together. So I mentioned earlier that we deal with like a lot of different project files. So like Revit files, Revit, FBX, 
Um, and the problem is they need to all talk to each other. They all need to be coordinated. They all need to like drop into the same spot. So what we're able to do is actually use a sync function. So watch this. I grab these guys. It's going to load in. Okay. These are some trees that I have as a placeholder. I'm going to hit sync coordinates. And it's not going to look like anything. But once I start dropping in the other buildings, I'm going to make a mess right here just to show you. I've got this. I've got my buildings all in pieces. Here's a nice little sign. And here is our set model. So this, so this looks like a mess. I'm going to go over to my outliner and make sure I'm in fly mode. So this is no good, right? Because everything is kind of all over the place. They're not talking to each other. So if I select all these and I hit sync coordinates, all my models actually fall into place. So I've got the landscape here. I've got my tower here. I've got the podium building. And I have the whole site here. So this is really nice because now I can have Revit and Rhino talk to each other. And instead of like work sessioning into like a really beefy Rhino file, I can actually just have it all in one spot. So don't mind me. I'm just setting a timer. I want to make sure I don't go over time. Okay. So now that I do that, I just want to save this. Always good to save your work. Um, and I'm going to be bad and save it on my desktop. But what I do is once everything is in here, I start with my materials. So my project here, all this is like brushed metal. So what I do is I go over to assets. And I talked a lot about um, our team like material library. So right over here, I actually have a team space. And these are all the KPF materials that we've spent time building together. So these are like vetted materials. So we've got glass, we've got metal. And these are ones that you know all of our, our Viz Power users have sat down and talked about. So not only can you have like the default um, T5 materials, you can make your own, and they can be shared to anybody in the office. So that's that's huge from a standards point of view. So I'm going to start with this material, and I'm going to place it here. And one thing I want to do is there is a little brushed texture. It might be hard to zoom to see on zoom, but I want to just increase the scale. So I can actually change the normal map scale by itself. I'll change this to one. I can even darken it like this. So I'm happy with this. And a good practice is lock in one material. And if you're going to reuse it, do that first and then start copying it around. So that's that brush I was talking about. I can paste it here and paste it here, paste it here. This guy is actually rotated. So all I have to do is literally just go to the map and just type in 90. And now you can see how the brush is actually going to the right. I'm just going to wrap up the other materials. And I'm going to make sure there's no more red left. Okay, cool. So that was done. And how the materials work here, although I'm duplicating them, they are their own standalone instance. So if I made this red, see how the other ones aren't changing? So they're just based off of each other, but they're not inheriting all the parameters, uh, which is kind of nice. So the glass right here, this, I'm going to go in and use my own KPF glass, right? Because we've done the work. I don't need to remake glass. And the D5 library has plenty of glass. I'm not saying they don't. It's just I want to show you, like, we love this thing. <laughs> so we've got that there. And remember earlier when I was talking about how we deal with, like, a lot of towers and you just kind of, like, see the slabs? If I have the opacity a little bit less so it's not as... Not as bright. Let me just show you this. Yeah, you see how we can see the slabs? Not a great look. Uh, and Speculator is just controlling the brightness. But this isn't a great look for us. And you see how you can see right throughout? Because in the real world, you would have like office furniture and all that. So one thing that we really like is the parallax interiors. And why I was talking about them before is it literally solves this issue. So I can go right under model and under interior parallax. I can get these faked planes that represent offices or residential units. So let's just grab this office just to show you. And this is the plane. It might not look like much, but watch this. If I rotate it and then I move my camera around, you see how this wall now appears? It's not like a, a dumb 2D plane. Like it's actually smart. And I can I can actually change how bright the light is. So like look at this. It's all, all dynamic. I can change the position of all the elements. And if I were to stick this behind the glass, 
and put it over here, from far away, it looks like an actual modeled interior. So I, I can actually place like a dozen of these, make groups of them, easily duplicate them, change you know the brightness of everything, and make it look varied. So it's not just a boring, you know, simple model that's got nothing inside of it. So that's why I talk about parallax materials, and I think it's it's huge. Um, no reason not to use them. So look at that. So we talked about the materials here. I'm just going to brand this up a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about the materials elsewhere. So you'll see that right over here, it looks like there's a lot of white, but it's actually separated all by the rhino material name. So this we called it stones, just to help visualize this. I'm going to make this just like a different color. So we can start thinking about this. So this is all sidewalk. So I'm just going to make this gray. This is all asphalt. I'll make it black. Just so you can see, like there's a bunch of different materials here. And we also have the lake here. So if I want, I can continue placing um, different materials. Super easy. I can search for asphalt because this is all straight, right? So I can do that and grab this guy, and then I can paste it in here. Okay. So because of my units of this model, the scaling looks super, super weird. If I were to change this, try. Yep, that looks normal. And so that took no time. I can literally go in and start tweaking um, how shiny it is, how reflective it is, and everything. And I can even copy this over to my sidewalk and just make it white. So, again, quick, easy trick to kind of do all your materials. There we go. So, we've got that. Um, let's see. I can also tackle my lake, right? So, all these assets are in here. So, I've got water here as well. I can grab all these different lakes. They can have ripples, they can be calm. I just grab this. It's going to load. And then I can drop that there. And there we go. And I've got, yeah, all this green here. So that's why it looks funny. But the material looks like that. And I can change all this. Yeah, there we go. That looks much better. Uh, but you can see we're getting, you know, from a nice looking tower here. Sure, there's like some weird green reflections here, but that's, that's because I haven't finished that. So I can find a nice, um, you know, grass material or a landscape material. Um, and these, these are 2D. If I want, I could generate 3D grass, um, and that will literally generate like meshes. So I can show that as well. But just to show you, like it doesn't take a lot of time for us to like go in here and just make like really nice high quality images. So I'll leave it at that. And I want to get into start placing assets because I don't want to run out of time. So right over here is scatter. So check this out. If I go here, I can select the material. So I'm basically saying I want you to generate vegetation or foliage on this plane. If I click this, I can hit create. And now it's basically creating a grid and it's describing like the density of like where assets should spawn. If I click this, it's going to open up my asset library. I'm going to go over to Broadleaf. And all I have to do is literally just start selecting assets and it's going to start spawning them on this grid. So I'm going to add some more. So now I've got about four assets spawning in. Got there. And what's cool here is this percentage is actually just some simple math. So it's spreading up the division of all these trees across, um, across the formula. So I can actually say like spawn less. That's the probability of occurrence. And now this guy will spawn 14% of the time and these guys will increase. Um, I can even go one step further and change how, how close they spawn to each other, or I can change the overall density of the scene as well as the pattern. If you look here, you see how everything's in a grid? You know, that's not so realistic. That's because it's gridded along this white plane. If I were to go and find, you know, this cool like noise map right here, it's going to start mixing up the assets. I do that. That's one way of doing it. And grab that. Yeah. Do you see how varied that is? And then I can boost the density five times that. And now I've got like a really nice densely populated forest that took no time at all, right? That was very, very quick. So let me save real quick. And what I could do is generate a 3D grass on top of that. 
Um, but before I do that, I just want to show you the other cool tool. So right now we don't have any, you know, any trees or people. So how that works is I can go right over here to vegetation. Go to that, and I can do path. So I have these dummy um, placeholder trees from before. So this was just to let me know what it was like in Rhino. So what I can do is once I select an asset, let's say these guys and these guys, I can give it a path. And the path is basically a point A, point B, and fill in between. So what that means is if I click here and click there, notice how I just created a line of assets. So I've got all these. And let me start editing them. This is the container of assets. So I can either add more assets, subtract them, and I can increase the number. I can change the direction. I can randomize the direction. So that way they're not all like simple tiles, right? I can randomize their spacing and the offset. And this is all to just add some realism. Because in the real world, not everything grows in a straight line. There's, there's offset. And then random size is really nice. Because now I can just do this. And now I've got you know different sizes. And all I have to do is literally just copy these. I can copy them and play with their own individual settings. And now they don't look so samey same. So really simple way to just get all this different um, vegetation in the scene. So like from far away, if I were to like make a scene or a camera, I can get some really nice rendering. And I've only been doing this for like 10 minutes, right? So that's with trees. Let's talk about cars. You can choose people or cars, I do this, it knows that it should be cars. Uh, let's find a typical car, let's go small size. We'll grab a Tesla, why not? And we'll grab this Land Rover. Um, and we'll throw, in, we'll throw in a Lexus too. Okay, so now that I've got all these assets, oops, move this guy down, okay. And I can drag out a line and it will actually spawn all these cards in, uh, which is really cool. So if I hit done, I can choose how many cars I want in here with density, right? I can choose the amount of lanes, right? So if this is like super wide, I can do that. I can also do front and back, so like typical traffic. Um, and I believe, yeah, I had that on still. This is dynamic mode. And the assets move, like, that's awesome. So I can have people moving, I can have cars moving, and I can animate, you know, this like bustling scene um, in just like no time at all. I can change the width, kind of fit all of this. And then I can even go back and play with the, uh, the points and the path and everything. So if I do that, I can literally do this. But I hope you're beginning to see like this is actually not taking that much time at all. So now that I'm like happy with like my materials and everything, I just want to talk about setting up camera scenes. So I'm just going to hit a new scene. And the scenes, that's what I was talking about earlier, kind of like the bookmarks. If I were to add another one here, I can now switch between them just like that. So this is also like a nice way to kind of create like a virtual tour for your project. Let's say you're in a meeting and you, know, you want to show your client something. This is one way of doing it. Um, very, very simple. So I've got this here. Let's edit some camera settings. Um, I can play with the exposure or leave it on auto. So if I want to make it darker, I can lower that. But I'm happy with this. I'm going to change it to two-point perspective. That way everything's vertical. I can change the aspect ratio. So I can do 16 by 9, right, like that. Or I could do something portrait, like that. And that takes literally no time at all. And these are the typical ones. So it's not like anyone has to type anything in. Then I can play with the focal length. The thing of that has almost like the zoom. Okay, so I've got do 33 is a little much. Do that. I'm just going to update my scene here. And I can do depth of field. And depth of field, all I have to do is set a focus. I want my building to be a focus and increase the blur. And you'll see that these trees, since they're close to the camera, are going to start blurring. That took no time at all. I didn't need to figure out the focus distance. I literally just told it what I wanted. Um, so this is huge. Um, so not only do I have this, but I can also just change the environment settings. But since we we're talking about AI and the power of AI and everything, I can actually have AI give me some nice stylistic choices. So watch this. I'm going to make a copy of this. And now I'm going to go over to the AI atmosphere match. I'm going to upload a reference image. And I'm going to upload this guy. So this is like a very, very stylized view. Um, and I'm doing that just to show you, like, it can actually pick up on these really drastic changes 
So my point here is I want like a really nice orangey background um, and I want, you know, kind of like a silhouetted building. So this should be you know, very difficult to do because we're talking about like exposure settings, shadow settings, light settings. Um, so this is really like testing um, D5. But you can see it's like thinking and it's already beginning to silhouette the building. It changed my background here. And now, give it a second. There we go. And the cool thing is this isn't like a one and done and like that's it. No, these are like an HDRI that's now existed and it's all editable, right? Now I've got this here and I can go, you know, a step further and start playing with shadow settings in here. I can play with the contrast and everything. So my point is it's not like it just gave me a filter and I can't move like typical AI applications. This is like plugged directly into the software. It's not like a gimmicky thing. It's like actually changing our light settings, our effect settings, all that's changing. Um, and that was one image, right? So if if that didn't do it for you, um, I can grab another one and show you what that looks like. So this one, this one's a little uh, a little moodier. Um, and this is just, you know, I wanted to have kind of like a, what's the best way to say this? Kind of like a, a bloomy kind of look. Uh, I wanted to pick up on some of these nice colors and everything. And you can literally just see it think, um, which is really, really cool. So happy with the results so far, but I hope you're getting my point. Like this is so quick. Um, and that's why it's so important to have AI directly built into your tool sets instead of something extra. So we're getting the same colors, right? We're getting the clouds and everything. And again, this is all dynamic. And this actually did it with the dynamic uh, sun system. I can actually just change the north offset and I can even change the clouds because the clouds are dynamic. So this is crazy. Like if I didn't know what I was doing, right? I could literally just upload an image and then I can just tweak. Um, so really, really amazing stuff. So if I, you know, am happy with this, I can go and render it and then I can put it through the, uh, the AI enhancer. But how that works is I can literally go here to image, <clears throat> ask it for a size, let's say a 2K preset. And I can also render out uh, channels like material ID and all that. I'm going to hit render, save this, and it's going to think real quick um, and generate an image. It's going to help improve the lighting, uh, the camera effects, and everything. Um, so you can see it's going pretty fast. And I'm not like on a crazy laptop, I'm, I'm not on a desktop. Let me see what I have here. Um, and it's able to generate a pretty quick image in just you know, no time at all. Um, so that was what, I don't know, like 30 seconds. So I lied, that was 22 seconds. So I can go to the AI enhancer, and this is what I was talking about, it doing like a polish pass. So this will take a little bit longer, but you'll see it's going to enhance some of the materials, um, some of the, um, the lighting and the vegetation. So. so I've got a couple more minutes on this. So while this is baking, um, the next thing I want to show you once this comes out is the, the actual animation process, like how the templates work, how to actually drop them in, and how quick it is to just turn this into an animation. But, you know, again, I've only been doing this for like 17 minutes, right? And we were able to import everything, materialize it, do some, um, some light studies with the, uh, the AI tool, right? We set up some camera views and we're moving it into AI. So like we're talking about from 3D model to deliverable for a client in a very, very short period of time. Um, and I even like get into all the crazy settings of, of D5, right? I was, I was leveraging the existing asset library, our own KPF library and the AI tool. So I'm gonna zoom in and you'll see look what's going on here. You see how much sharper that is? Even these buildings, right? Look at what's happening. Make this a little bit bigger. And I'll zoom in. See that? Before and then after. Before, after. Look, look at the clouds too, right? So again, like, why wouldn't you do this? And so like we're we're you know so happy that it's like built directly in. We don't need third-party tools. So then when it comes to the animation templates, this are you know, all the typical projects about our uh, camera types. So if I click this, I've got a horizontal push and it's literally just pushing the camera. And if I didn't want that, 
I can actually just do the cameras uh, myself. So I'm going to delete that. If I add a camera view here and I move my timeline down and then I just push my camera, say there, and hit camera view, now it's just going to do this. And I could slow it down by just changing the time here. If I do that, now it's going to take eight seconds to go from point A to point B. So all I have to do is just keep adding cameras and that's it. So I'll end the demo there. Um, and I want to get to the last parts. I know we're running out of time, but I hope you get the point. Super, super simple. I'll leave that up in case anyone has questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about adoption. Uh, so one thing I can't stress enough, um, you know, especially those in design technology and who make decisions about tools, I think it's important for you to just understand what your team needs and just build around that. Like, don't go and get like every single tool in a package, you know, looking at you, Adobe, um, you don't need all 20 tools. You need like the important stuff. You need to think about what people are actually using and like talk to your users and build around that. Like, because I had the conversation with leadership a year ago about what we needed, it was so easy for us to say, hey, these are the checkboxes we need to tick. You know, who can do that? So I want to talk a little bit about adoption. Um, I think it's really important to focus on like the quick wins. What were your pain points? How do you resolve them? And how do you make this as simple as possible? Like we were talking about like fast results um, right out of the gate. Like that, that's the biggest thing for us, right? And I think it's really important, you know, whoever is like testing um, your software, um, within the firm, you know, celebrate them, you know, express gratitude because they're spending time to test a new tool for you, right? Uh, when it comes to leadership support, I mean, we're talking about, you know, saving the company money. How can we do things better, faster, higher quality? So doing our pilot, we were able to express like, hey, we're saving a lot of money here um, and there's a huge impact. And really important, back to my quote before, is like focus on the quality of life things, not just like all the random little features in a tool that nobody uses, right? So features that matter, you don't need fluff, okay? Um, and then when it comes to general adoption in general, you know, that's fine. Um, we always found like doing these workshops where we sit down with teams and like we work through a project, that's been most effective. And then from there, we'll meet individually with teams. Uh, we've also set up like a community group chat where we can share ideas, inspiration, tips. Um, and then we also let people know that there's like plenty of YouTube videos out there um, and Scene Express, which is a, a repository of free scenes to learn from. So these guys, super, super effective uh, when it comes to just showing people what to do. So people don't have the time to explore and learn themselves. If you figured it out, you can share that with people. And at the end of like our pilot, we wound up with 150 of our users, our Viz users, um, in three months. So that was huge for us. Usually it takes like years to do a rollout, but we feel like since we were so like adamant about targeting our pain points and just saying like, this is what we're fixing, this is where we're solving, it's making your life easier. People just got it. I, I know I said no brainer a lot, but literally like when you see it, you're like, oh wow, this is like such a huge improvement to what we're used to. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what is the future of like where AI is in, in design. Um, basically my, my point is AI integrated tools is the future. So I always bring up the example of like Clippy from Microsoft Word, like, 20 years ago, this idea of having like an assistant in your tool to make things easier and faster. I think that's where, that's where things are going and like how D5 integrated AI, we're gonna see a lot more of that, I hope. And just targeting the tedious tasks. You know, I talked about the texture making, the, uh, the AI atmosphere, like the environment settings, animation templates, like simplifying that stuff, the stuff they're doing on a daily basis. That's gonna be, we're gonna see more of that and just making nicer images faster. Um, but Again, back to Clippy, it's going to be a direct part of the workflow. It's not going to be a siloed thing, like we're going to go to the AI tool area. No, it's going to be like part of our, of our workflow. Um, and I think just for like any firms that are like teetering on whether to AI or not, I think everyone who adopts it, you're going to be able to generate so much more and really be at the forefront. Otherwise, you're just going to fall behind because everyone's generating a thousand options in just like a couple hours, right? So anyways. If you're really interested about D5, uh, there's four great plans. Uh, you can start off for free, if you're a student, it's free, uh, but for D5 Pro users, 30 bucks a month. And if you're a team, meaning like you have multiple people and you wanna collaborate, uh, that's about $59 a month. But as a thank you for coming, um, D5 team has generated a 
free trial of Defect Pro. And if you like listening to me talk and rant about this stuff, uh, feel free to connect with me. Um, I've got a YouTube channel talking about all this stuff. And I'm off, also offering a discount code for a, uh, a premium D5 course uh, that I offer. So that'll knock it down like 90%. Um, but definitely connect with me on LinkedIn and we can talk more about this. So anyways, I'm open for the q and I know we've got seven minutes, so I'll try and answer them quick. Thank you so much. So we'll jump right into the Q&A. Um, first question, are you using D5 for schematic design, DD, and CD? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so it starts in concept, right? And then once we like win the project, then it evolves with us. So it's really like a tool that grows with like the maturity of the file. Um, so really, really heavy usage and concept for all the design iterations. SD for just refining, you know, figuring out the materiality and then DD to refine further. CDs, uh, yes, for like little explorations, like, oh, what does this wall study look like? But not as like macro that you would see in like concept or SD. Great. Um, Percival wants to know, are there any plugins available for ARCHICAD? Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure I saw ARCHICAD on the, um, on that real-time live sync. Um, I'm like 95% sure. Cool. Um, Joe would like to know what what laptop do you use? Uh, so this is, I've got an Intel Core Ultra 9 and an Ada 4000 GPU. Uh, and as you saw, that was a big scene. And I don't know if you saw the FPS up top, but I was floating around like 30 to 45 FPS after the scatter. So the scatter was was pretty uh, pretty intense and I was still getting like, really nice frame rates. Um, Hamid would like to know if you can render plans uh, as well. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I didn't show it um, yet, but um, when I was doing the camera setup, there was like perspective in two point, you can actually switch it to plan and just like render straight down uh, and that'll be orthographic. Yeah, and you can also do section volume. So you can literally chop off a floor if you want, um, that way you can like see within it. So you could do your dollhouse views. Cool. Um, so and would like, can we export materials from D5 and save them into our personal laptop in order to edit the D5 materials? So what you should do is do all your texture mapping. So generate your texture maps first then import into D5 and then add it to either your local team space or your, um, sorry, your local space, which is local to your machine. And that'll be under your asset library or add it to your team space. And then whenever you make edits to it, you can actually push the update to it. So you can actually tweak in D5 and then push to your library. Okay. Um, how does D5 support collaboration for design teams? Mm. So using the uh, multi-editor function, basically you convert your project to a uh, multi-editor and you set up work sets. So work sets can say, th this is how I think about it. Um, if you think of like a KPF project, we've got like a tower, a podium and context, and then, you know, periphery stuff. So we could set up a work set for a tower and one person works on the tower then another works up for the podium and another person works on the podium together. And then the third person could be context and they're just doing, you know, set dressing, the trees, the lights, the cameras and everything. And then once someone does an update, they do save and everyone gets a little like blue notification saying, hey, there's an update. You hit update and then it, it reloads your model and then you see the changes. Um, so very, very similar to the Revit Sync to Central uh, methodology. Um, pretty straightforward. It's like you just work in your own space and you can't touch anyone else's stuff. You can't touch their materials or um, place assets on it. So it's like you have to think about how you want to break up your file. Can you share any notable success stories or case studies where D5 AI has significantly enhanced creative workflows or project outcomes? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing for us is like the upscaler is is huge for us um, because in general, like 3D people, they kind of, you know, they all look the same that they're not like super photorealistic and the upscaler actually does a really good job of making them look like 
PNG cutout quality. Um, same thing with like the materials and everything. Um, but in general, I mean, we are we use so much AI, so many AI tools for like the concept generation of for like look and feel boards for the style transfer stuff I was talking about, like moving from photorealistic to um, to stylized. That way, it's not like oh, this is super early on. This is what it's going to look like. Um, so we we use it a lot for that. Um, I mean, in this case study. Like just the ability to generate like near outsource quality renderings in just like a day and save us like tens of thousands of dollars. Like that's huge. And now we're just like seeing that across the board with more and more teams like relying less on other um, teams, uh, other outsourced uh, vendors. So yeah, we're just seeing it all all across the board. But like you need to embrace AI. Like get past the the legal stuff. Have your legal team like review that. But it's it's here to stay. Like it's not like a gimmicky thing like the metaverse. You know, it's it's like a, an actual thing. Cool. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Um, from Deborah, can we have accurate lighting products via IES files or manufacturer Revit files to show true output? Mm, yeah. So it supports um lumens and candelas as units uh, and you can also upload your own uh, IES profiles and if you are in uh, Revit uh, you may have seen in that uh, that slide with the, uh, the LiveSync plugin you can transfer those lights your Revit lights directly into D5 so yes great okay uh, that's the, that was the last question that we can take today I'm going to wrap us up with some closing words Thank you all so much for attending the live webinar, Navigating Modern Architectural Challenges, Leveraging AI Tool for Enhanced Design Solutions, a CE Strong webinar series powered by the Architects newspaper. This presentation was sponsored by D5 Render. This webinar is recorded and can be easily replayed using the same registration link. Please allow seven business days to process certificates of participation and AIA credit reporting for this presentation. A big thank you again to our presenter, Andy Christopheru, and to D5 Render for sponsoring this webinar. We hope to see you all again at our future event. Have a great day.